How's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's brand new Lumix Live. We are really excited to be, uh, you know, coming back with you guys with a guest this time. Uh, if you've joined us for the last uh, couple sessions we've had, obviously we're going back and forth between having guests on, having more instructional sessions, uh, and thank you again to all of those that participated last week in our uh, monthly AMA session that we're planning to do now at the end of every month. If you are new to Lumix Live, this is our weekly show where we have conversations with photographers, videographers, producers, directors, uh, the team here at Panasonic to bring answers to the questions that you've all had over the, I don't know, entire time that you've been Panasonic users. Uh, if you are, again, if you are new, make sure to subscribe to the Lumix Cameras channel. It helps us out tremendously in growing this platform and continuing to bring you these kinds of events. Uh, if you like these videos, make sure to like and subscribe, the whole nine yards that you normally do with YouTube stuff. Uh, I'm sure everyone's used to hearing those phrases over and over and over again. Uh, in the meantime... Uh, shout out in the chat where all of you are viewing from. We love seeing where everyone is joining Lumix Live from. Uh, if you have questions for myself or for our guest, make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras in the chat bar so that it pops up on my side. I can see the questions and our team that are monitoring can also be able to answer some of those questions if it's something that we can't get to on air. So with that, uh, we are uh, joined by one of our ambassadors here in the U.S., Matthew Sutherland, to talk about Lumix for video. So, hey, Matthew, how are you? I'm doing great, Sean. How you doing? Uh, you know, can't complain, can't complain. It's, it's uh, really nice here in Austin, Texas. Uh, as I see, we have uh, a, another Austin, Texas person in the chat. Uh, where, where are you joining us from? So I'm from Santa Clarita, California, which is just north of Los Angeles. It's 108 today in uh, Santa Clarita, California, <laughs> but it's dry and uh, it's nice. So I, a awesome. month from now, I'll be bragging, uh, but for now, I sweat. <laughs> we we uh, uh, here in Austin, I think we, we just got past our like super crazy hot temperatures we're like in the 70s to 90s right now. I know that's a big swing, but when it was 114 degrees, yeah, that's 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 fun. So, um, yeah. So for for those that are joining us, uh, could you give us a little bit of a background as to who you are, what you do, um, and what I like to ask everybody is how you got into photography or videography. Absolutely, yeah. So I own a company called Matrimony Films. Uh, we do about 100 weddings a year, and we do a lot of corporate branding, corporate messaging. Um, I've been a Panasonic Lumix ambassador for about three, almost four years, I think. And um, I actually started out as an actor. I All I wanted to do my whole life was be an actor. Uh, and my parents took me to Hollywood. Well, they didn't. They just moved to Southern California. But I thought they were taking me to Hollywood to, for me to be a star when I was a kid. Um, and I went to UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television to uh, study acting and filmmaking. And I really kind of fell in love with filmmaking when I thought I was just going to be in front of the camera. I really fell in love with the editing and the, uh, the storytelling um, and really a lot of the filmmaking techniques that I learned there at UCLA. And so I've been doing this. Um, well, actually, as, as I, you know, as I was acting, my wife is stable and, and uh, you know, along the way, I realized that with acting, you have almost no control over <laughs> whether or not you get a job. And uh, as a filmmaker, you can actually control your own destiny a little bit. So uh, I started doing more and more filmmaking and started to be find myself behind the camera a lot more, enjoying kind of like putting the product, the productions together. And so I've, I've been a filmmaker now uh, with this company and my corporate company now for about eight years. Wow. So that's how I found myself behind the camera. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. So, I mean, you know, as as we were talking about, you know, at the beginning, this is a, a session devoted to Lumix for video. Um, and someone who who from your your experiences, you know, obviously, as you said, you've been with Lumix for a long time now. 
you've you've been with us through a lot of growth as a brand, obviously through the ear earlier ish years of the Micro Four Thirds platform, up into now the S series. So, I'm curious, you know, how looking at at, at the transition. How has your use of the cameras kind of evolved? Uh, you know, going through Micro Four Thirds and full frame, how do you you balance the use of the systems in your your workflow? Okay, well, I'll I'll quickly give you a little bit more of a background. I actually started the Sony VX100, so that was a mini DV tape camera. And that was my first wedding filmmaking camera. Um, and I've actually always owned a camera. I was the kid on my block in sixth grade and I made my dad get a video camera. We actually had the video camera with like big VCR packs you'd wear on your waist and you'd have this big camera on your shoulder. But my friends would make films like every Saturday, we'd just get together and from sun up to sundown, we'd be making movies and laughing at each other and having a blast. So. Um, but yes, I, I actually started with a Panasonic DVX100 right when I started, probably about 18 years ago. Um, and then I transitioned, you know, eventually into DSLR and, you know, I went to a different brand for a, a year and went, this is ridiculous. And then I got in on the GH3 uh, and that was, you know, like I couldn't wait to get back to Panasonic. So I've been a Panasonic user forever and that's basically you know like why i pursued being an ambassador for panasonic is i've just been loving everything about panasonic cameras for ever since i've been doing this i have actually a good friend who's a documentary filmmaker his name's greg whiteley he just won an emmy for cheer the the tv show cheer on netflix and he also has been a Panasonic user forever. We actually, I, I bought his DVX 100 that he made his first documentary with. And then he moved on to the 200 with the, with the P2 cards. Um, and then from there, like I've just seen so much growth and so much um, ability to tell stories in, in such a better way, the way Panasonic has developed. When the Micro Four Thirds format came out, I was so thrilled. I mean, that GH4 was just revolutionary. And I was the only one in the wedding film business making 4K wedding films at the time. And it was just a huge selling point. And just the ability to be so mobile and so, um, you know, I can have multiple sets. Like I, I've got three teams of guys that make films so we can do three weddings on a day. And the the fact that I can have everyone using the same kind of cameras at you know a low you know like reasonable price point is uh, is really I mean like the fact that I can have a the thirty five to one hundred lens is less than a thousand dollars versus the you know the competing brands seventy to two hundred which is at <laughs> least twice as much right yeah so it just allows me to have multiple teams and not break the bank basically yeah. but i i mean i've been such a huge fan of the image stabilizers inside when that gh5 came out with the internal stabilizer it just it, it's a game changer i mean you know i use a gimbal but you you know when you find yourself in a pinch run and gun you don't have to use a gimbal so it's uh it's been really a great way to you know help me build my business from yeah. the beginning no, and, and that's 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 kind of I think one of the exciting things about the way the industry's kind of shifted. You know, you're able to get these powerhouse cameras that used to be, you know, financially not really possible for volume use because I mean, let's face it, back when the GH four came out, it was the first consumer camera to bring four K recording. You were up into exponentially more money if you wanted to outfit like you said, multiple people to be able to output the same quality as your main cam. So as, as your, your, your process has expanded, um, I know you, you were saying that you do a ton of weddings every year. How has the, the micro four third system we'll, we'll start with, how has the micro four third system kind of worked or changed your workflow over the years with the different updates that have come out? 
Well, um, it's it's made it so that I can shoot um, basically, you know, like the 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 ability for me to shoot with multiple different lenses in multiple different situations is you know is 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 huge and and there's a lot of people doing that and obviously it's become hugely popular and um i do a lot of traveling and so i'll do destination weddings all the time and i don't want to check my bag that's got my camera gear in it when i'm going to go shoot a travel wedding yeah. Um, so I've got a, a the low pro backpack that I put on and I've got two bodies and two sets of lenses, literally, I mean like seven, eight lenses I've got with two bodies and it's with me on the airplane. I know it's going to arrive at my destination. <laughs> I might not be wearing any clothes, <laughs> but I will have cameras and be able to shoot. So it's been so portable and so mobile with, a wedding film business it's uh it's just been awesome as far as being able to have i mean i'm i'm literally shooting multi-camera weddings you know so my i'll have a second guy that comes with me as well if if the wedding calls for it and now we've got four bodies and four sets of lenses so we can get four angles at every wedding whether i'm shooting in or cayman or italy or whether i'm shooting in Los Angeles down the street. So it keeps my brand consistent throughout and all of my shooters can shoot with the same cameras, the same lenses, and our, our end result looks the same no matter who's shooting or where we're shooting, which is just great for our brand. Nice, nice. Now, talking about that, that consistency, um, you know, the, there's a lot out there with, you know, well, if the the questions that we're getting asked a lot of is, you know, uh, from a shooting experience, so the actual mm -hmm. creation of, of your footage, could you walk us through maybe a little bit of a process of like, you know, what, what color profiles do you typically tend to shoot with? Are you shooting in log? You know, that, that kind of um, side of, of how you shoot? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, admittedly, look, I am not a gearhead. Okay, I'm not. Um, so I forgive. Uh, forgive me for those who are. I appreciate you. I I ask you thousands of questions. And I'm not saying necessarily you, Sean, but yeah. you. Uh, I'm. I love storytelling. So let's start there. Yeah. I also want to be profitable. So. <laughs> I have decided, I made a decision a while ago that I'm going to shoot in a profile that looks great out of camera so that we can get these edited quickly because I'm sorry, but our clients tend to not be as, uh, the, their bar is not nearly as high as ours in the, uh, especially in the gearhead world. <laughs> so I do not shoot log. I'll shoot log for a corporate film that's going to have time to set up and time to edit and is looking for a certain level of um, production quality that, you know, that you're going to want to get from a log profile. Yeah. But I shoot natural profile and I love it. It, it, for whatever reason, it looks great out of camera. So I, I work as hard as I can working with my team to make sure our white balance is right when we're shooting and that our exposure is right when we're shooting and if we can grab the right exposure and the right white balance and shoot in natural profile, it just, it, we, it saves us so much time in editing and we basically can turn these around a lot quicker. I mean, a bride who gets an Instagram trailer from us, like a one minute trailer on Monday after her Saturday wedding, it's just, we've created a fan for life and yeah. that's really what our brand calls for. So I try to shoot right out of camera that way. So natural profile. Um, I shoot 4K 24P. I love the 24 frame look, the film look. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll color grade a, a little bit. You know, we'll drop our exposure a little, maybe up the highlights a little to give us a little bit, you know, like pol more polished look, crush the blacks a little bit. But other than that, we try not to, you know, obviously there's little times where, you know, you move from one light to another while you're shooting and obviously the white balance is off. So you have to maybe do a little fixing, mm -hmm. but more, more often than not, we're trying to get our look every time right out of camera. 
Yeah. That's, that's, I think, a really good point that a lot of people, I think, maybe overlook is that all of us, just like you said, you know, at, at least from this side, I, I am a total gearhead. I love picking <laughs> apart all of the, yeah, you know, all of the little details about it. I, I love digging into it and finding where the most flexible point is. And I think a lot of the people in the chat, a lot of the people that, that join us every week have a very similar look on the equipment that, that they use. But being able to put everything into perspective like you did with, you know, look, if, if you're a business, you need to make money. You need to find the fastest route from A to B that yeah. gives you the quality that your customers are looking for, that your clients are expecting from you. And there's a lot, I think, that goes behind that. Um, we were talking beforehand about this with, you know, lighting. Lighting is one of the most important things about video, aside from maybe necessarily audio. Um, could you give us a little bit of insight into how you utilize lighting to help in getting yourself out of camera as correct as you can? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, lighting is, is huge and you can't underestimate the, the ability of lighting to make you look like a pro, total pro or make you look like a total amateur. So, um, and, and, I think what people should always keep in mind as well is that even the pros oftentimes, like if you look at half of their footage, it's going to look amateurish. They're just not going to show you that much, that part. So, you know, we all screw up all the time, but I mean, a good, you know, basically like, you know, what I've got here is, you know, on this light is a key, a good key light with a nice fill light is going to create shadows and depth and it's going to look nice, right? So I'm looking for a window light to give me a nice key light all the time. Anytime I can shoot by a window. And I think that's, that's a big thing for, you know, run and gun documentary shooters. A lot is, is sometimes we just think, Oh gosh, the story's happening and we have to just grab it where it is. And at times you do. And story is often more important than, you know, satisfying your, your peers as far as how good your, your footage looks. <laughs> but, you know, if you're upping your game and you're trying to get better production value, you know, moving, moving, whatever's happening, Hey, can we put that dress on over here by the window? Or can we, you know, put that bracelet or, you know, whatever over by the window. Now you've created a huge, beautiful key light and you can get a nice shadow. And I often will try to film shadow side so that I, you know, the camera shadow side, that'll give you a more cinematic look. Um, and then, you know, if you have a, a, if you have a second person with you who could hold, be holding kind of a fill light for you, that's ideal. It's not practical very often. I'll usually be shooting handheld sometimes in that moment with a side key light, you know, basically yeah. I have these awesome little Lytra, you know, lights that, Oh, look at that. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'll pop a Lytra, a little key light. I mean, this thing is super crazy powerful. I just go like that and then, ah! <laughs> um, basically <laughs> just having it ready side light, nice fill, you know, that that's a really good way to kind of give it a little bit more dimension lighting wise. Um, anytime you can think about shadow on a camera side, however you can achieve that, you're going to, you're going to get a more cinematic polished finished look. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, like even sometimes I'll have people doing things outside, like guys at weddings get ready outside all the time. Usually yeah. they just show up ready <laughs> and we pretend they're getting ready. Um, but if I can bring them into even just inside into a lobby or into somehow I get them inside so that there's going to be some sort of window key light with a shadow side I can get, it's just ultimately so much nicer looking. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with, with that, I think there's a couple of people that have asked some questions like, um, you know, around the issue of like noise in in video files. And I think... You know, w with a lot of shooting situations, if you have the ability to control some lighting, like you said, using these kind of these little compact lights ha has become a game changer for not just lighting, but for exposing your video footage. If you have that capability or you can 
take control of the scene and, and, you know, have everything maybe take half a step slower. It ends up allowing you to understand the exposure that you need to have set up. You know, are you, uh, as some people point out, if you're using one of the S series cameras and you have the dual native ISO system, well, you can then pick, okay, do I need to jump up to 4,000? Do I stay at 640? Yes. If you're in a GH5, you know, what ISO do I really want to be sticking at where I am comfortable with the way the noise pattern goes? Now, how do I just have to light it? Do I need to just make sure that I have a nice, good, like you said, solid window light that's got good, even flow coming in? How strong of a kicker light do I need for this? The rim lights, things like that. And yeah, it's not always feasible for for the different kinds of shooting. But I mean, honestly, like you said, with how portable these things are and how, oh, yeah. you know, how long they run on battery life, I think understanding lighting is a big key for people to massively boost their image quality in the video that they shoot. Hugely, yes. And, and I'll even say, uh, as a general rule for the GH5, I, I basically tell my guys, we do not go above 1250 ISO on the GH5. It can go to 1600, no problem, no noise. But if I tell them 1250, we're never going to worry about that threshold. And then we light accordingly. So yeah. you find light, you know, you see it 1250 ISO and you better, you know, find a way to make it lit properly. Right. So yeah. Um, and then, you know, we shoot in the dark all the time at a wedding. Um, so we actually have like, uh, this light in motion, basically light that'll light our reception speeches. That's a huge thing where you can control the light for speeches if you decide you're going to. So you put that on a light stand, you point, basically, you know, you, if you run the show and tell people this is where you're going to do your speech and you're nice about it. And I usually put them really close to the bride and groom so that they basically can just have a conversation with the bride and groom during a speech. And I know that spot's going to get some good light and I'm going to have a shadow, you know, camera going shadow side on the person speaking. It's going to be beautiful end result. Yeah. Uh, so some of the other, um, the other questions that I've, I've seen come through here. So when it comes to your kit for actually shooting, um, I know we, we've mentioned a lot about the GH series. So when you're actually going out, do you set up like your camera in a rig? Are you using like any extra stabilization systems? Like how, how does a typical setup camera look for you when you're out on a job? Yeah. I, so I'll have, um, I'll have one camera on that. It's going to be on a slider and it's basically I've got the same plate that's going to pop from a slider to a tripod and I can go handheld. And then I have a second camera on a Ronin S gimbal. So we've got a gimbal ready to go and we have a slider tripod ready to go at all times. And I know as rock solid and amazing as a camera guy that I am, my shots always look better <laughs> when they're stabilized. Oh yeah. Everyone's do. I'm sorry to break it to you, but your handheld is not as good as anyone else's slider or tripod, you know. So I, I always tell my guys to be deliberate with your camera motion. And we try to find, you know, our, our goal in a documentary wedding shoot specifically is capture the moment, like whatever's happening, capture it. And then once we're capturing it, how do I make it look more pretty? How do I make the light better? How do I make some cinematic motion? So we're constantly, you know, working hard, never giving up, always like trying to make it look nicer. And yeah, be great. The gimbal can be great, but they even like some people who just go, oh, I got a slider and I got, oh, I got a gimbal. I'm just going to like move the camera around. It's going to be awesome. You should be deliberate like with your motion. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. should know, like, how's it going to cut into the next shot? Like if I'm going to gimbal this way and then slide this way, sometimes that's jarring, you know? Mm -hmm. So you basically, if you're th thought out, the more you can think it out, the more you can think like a filmmaker and uh, you're the, the better you're going to be ultimately. So if I'm, if I'm going to go, you know, like wide gimbal shot at a, like covering the reception room, and I'm going to be spinning left and then I'm going to do a slide on a detail. So now I'm cutting, coming left in big sweeping motion to cutting a detail on a slider. 
now you've got two really pure cinematic motions that are going to complement each other and um, look really nice in a nice edit. Nice. Yeah. So expanding a little bit from, from the, the micro four thirds cameras, um, have you, have you had experience uh, working with the L mount system? So the S series in your workflow yeah. yet? Yeah. So I, I've got an S one H and I love it. I love it for what it does. And, and I think we talked about this as well. Like I, it's much more of a corporate work camera for me personally. I think some people are shooting weddings with it and doing fantastic work. Um, and the S five is going to be even a better option. I think for that, as far as mobile and run and gun. Um, but I just have grown to love the mobility and the, the lightweight 10 hours holding a G camera versus like a, an S camera. But when I can, when I can set it on a tripod or a slider and I can do something that's more planned out where all my shots planned out corporate job, that S one H is fantastic. So I've actually just been shooting three films, uh, corporate films with the S one H, uh, and I'm falling more and more in love with it as, as I use it. Um, so yeah, I've got a, basically I have the 24 to 70 lens. I have the 24 to 105 lens and I have a 16 to 35. So, uh, the, the ability of it to the dual native ISO is just incredible as far as you basically can create your own lighting situations, no matter what your light. And that is a little bit of a game changer there. Um, and just the, you know, the high end look that you get out straight out of camera is is spectacular. I've dabbled a little bit with like the ProRes RAW. I have a Ninja V or Ninja Five. What do the gearheads call it? Ninja V. <laughs> I think it's a Ninja what Five. I think is what it's Ninja what the five. actual name of it is. I think. <laughs> oh, and hey, I trust you. Um, well, I'm sure they'll tell us in the comments. Oh, of course. Um, but uh, but yeah, and and what it's capable of is fantastic, and I'm I'm looking forward as much as anyone else to what people are going to do with it. For me personally, like that workflow is a uh, you know it's it's intense. Like you've got to be ready for that ProRes workflow, but it's a spectacular image. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really is. So I know. Um, let's let's shift gears a little bit because um, you you'd sent me over two videos uh, that I want to take a few minutes to to talk about them and show everybody the 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 two pieces that you sent over, um, and and we will be posting these videos as they come up on the screen. We'll be posting them up in the uh, I don't know little card icons that pop up on the top here when the video is played back. Um, I want to. Let's let's show the video and then I uh, will come back and and have a little chat about it. But I want to show the um, the travel video that you sent me over first. Um, that's cool. Yeah, sounds good. All right, cool. So let's do this. Let's 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 see if I can actually. Do you do want this me to properly. talk it up? Do I do I talk it up at all, or do we just show it and then we talk about it? Yeah, sure, talk it up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Panasonic gave me an opportunity to go to Thailand and basically. Um, it was based on like how well that G series workflow is going to work um, when you're traveling to Asia. And so I was one bag. I literally had all my clothes and I had a GH5 and three lenses inside my bag. I had like two shirts and two pairs of pants. And, uh, and I, I, so basically very little stabilization opportunity. Um, I did not have a slider. I did not, I did have a small gimbal, um, but it, I most of the time found myself handheld. So uh, I did have a drone with me. Um, so, so basically we traveled around Thailand for 10 days and it was capture the sights and sounds of Thailand and show us what the G series looks like when we do that. So here it is. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. So, as you, for those watching, we've we've got the video playing as as Matthew was uh, talking about it. So let's um, let's let's take a look here at my uh, switching. Of course, did not want to do what I wanted it to do. So now we're back. Hey, cool live live <laughs> transitions, everybody. Um, All right. So so just like you're saying, I mean, you know that that I think is a, is a big kind of cool point for those that are looking at. You know, which which system do you look at? Do you look at a G series system or do you look at an S series system? And that travel video I think really 
pushes that point that you were talking about. You know, the G series is incredibly compact and so well suited for traveling to still get that quality of video out of it. And with, with a drone in my bag, the G5, GH5, three lenses, and basically I'm able to get on and off a plane with one bag. It's right on me the whole time. So I'm, I don't have to check any bags. I just jump from airplane to airplane and then start shooting whatever I see and whatever hits me. So I carried it with me the whole time. <laughs> just, it, it was so simple and yet gave such a great result. I was I, I thrilled. <laughs> can't wait till they have me go back. Can't wait. Can we can do that again? Right? Yeah. Right. Traveling would be so nice right now. <laughs> oh, <that's awesome. laughs> Home is lovely, but I would love to get my cameras and just go out and travel. And, and honestly, I mean, that's kind of the cool thing is that, you know, I can now choose, do I want to go take my G nine with me for photography since I'm more photography based personally, or do I want to yeah. take my S five and know that both of them are going to be more than capable to do the video capabilities that, I would want if I'm going to do video, but then still have amazing still stuff. Um, let's jump over and look at the the next video that you sent over. This is the uh, the Amanda and David video that you have. Um, so let's, uh, if you want to uh, give us a little bit of info on this while I uh, queue up and we start playing that one. Yeah. So basically, we we have lots of wildfires here in uh, Southern California, um, all up and down the coast. I think we have wildfires. Uh, this basically was shot, uh, we were three days away from the wedding in Los Angeles, and the uh, the venue that we were going to go to was on fire, so they could not get married at that venue. So they basically said, hey, we're flying everybody to Henderson, Nevada, and we're going to do this wedding in Henderson, Nevada at this place called the Green Valley Resort, I believe. Um, and basically, I was able to take me and my second shooter and we had two bags and gh fives and gimbals and sliders and off we went got in an airplane and flew to henderson nevada um and we shot this basically with three days notice that we're going to be traveling and doing a <laughs> destination wedding yeah oh man but yeah you know that that again like I, we've we, we've i think been really pushing a lot on this but you know that's that's kind of i think the the cool thing about all of this, you know, kind of capabilities that you have in the in these cameras is that you can just throw them in a bag, get out the door, and and be able to start creating and not have to necessarily really, you know, think too much about the equipment that you're carrying. It it just works and does the job you need. Um, with both of those pieces, uh, you know, what what kind of I think I, I want to say this. What what was probably the the best part of of the kit for those kinds of jobs? Was there anything that really stood out to you in the use of the cameras for those? Um, well, I'll, I'll definitely I'll answer it this way, and to ask me if you have a follow up on it. But uh, like, okay, so I shoot a lot of that with a twelve to thirty five, the twelve to thirty five two point eight lens. Um, I also have a Metabones adapter, so I can put any EF lens on there that I want, which is awesome and gives me even a lower um, f-stop on all of those lenses. So that's an awesome ability in that camera. But uh, I use a 12 to 35, but then I pop on that the um, Noctocron 42.5 1.2 lens, and like a lot of the close-up shots that you see in all these videos is with that lens. And it's just like, literally, I, I say this at workshops I teach all the time where I'm like, you know, I like got a lens on there and I'm like, man, I don't know. And then I pop that 42.5 to 1.2 and I'm like, whoa, look how good I am. And it's not me at all in any way. It's just that lens is sick. It's well, great. Hey man, I mean, that's, that's why that's that lens right there. Is that what that lens is? Oh, that's oh, yeah. awesome. Uh, okay. You got to make t-shirts. We need merch with, yeah, that, right? with that on there. Yeah. So th that lens is awesome. And then, um, so really that's kind of like everything. Like literally those two lenses stay on my camera all day long. I switch back and forth whenever I need a wide or that, or the uh, close up. That's beautiful. Yeah. Cool. So I, I'm going to take a look here before we uh, move on a little bit. Um, you see if if we have any other uh, 
conversation, any specific questions about this. As a reminder, everybody, if you're watching this and you have questions about uh, any of the stuff that you've seen or you have questions for both Matthew and myself, make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras. I know a lot of you are doing it in there already uh, for us to be able to answer. Uh, Jack is in the comments as well, answering the questions that are a bit more off topic than what the video is here, uh, than what we're talking about. So uh, if we don't answer it on stream, um, sorry, uh, it may just not be really, you know, <laughs> super dedicated to what it is that we're, we're talking about here. Um, so you basically like, so you, you, you've explained like, okay, you know, how, how you use the cameras in, in, in the field. Um, what, how has, you know, kind of taken a bit more of a, a business conversation on this, given how everything's gone this year. How has yeah. your business transitioned or, or I'd say adapt to, you know, obviously not being able to do as many weddings in the more traditional sense that we've been experiencing over the years? Yeah, I've had 60 weddings postponed to 2021. So that's, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm an optimist and I look at that as, okay, time to pack the pipeline with great talented shooters who can shoot twice as many weddings next year, right? There but, you go. <laughs> um, I've definitely focused uh, a lot on live streaming. Um, I've tried to dial in the way that I live stream this way to do workshops for people, but then also live streaming events. So the smaller events that I have shot, I offer live streaming to people. Um, and that's, um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the streaming software that just came out for, um, the Lumix streaming software, which is awesome. Oh yeah. But yeah, it live streaming has become huge and I think it's just going to become bigger and bigger if, throughout the next year based on the fact that we can now, anybody who is not comfortable traveling to an event, if they are going to hold the event, we can at least make it accessible for as many people that want to watch it as possible. And we can do that f from, we do it from three camera angles. We can do it up to four different camera angles. Um, and that, that has been a huge pivot for us. Uh, I had to learn it all and I had to call on my gearheads to help teach me about that stuff. But, uh, but that's been a lot of fun learning about, and it's it's so exciting to, and like I lose years off my life when I live stream an event and hope that everything's going to work. But uh, it's been great. Um, so that's a big way that we've changed. But also like just being able to, um, you know, offer our services for editing or um, you know, kind of trying to figure out what what do people need and what can we offer, how can we help. Um, yeah. and coming at business from an aspect right now of how you can help other people, it, it really opens a lot of doors that you just aren't thinking about when you start to worry about, Oh, this is what I do. How can I, well, I can't do it anymore. What, what, how can we help somebody else? Um, and that's also every time we help someone, whether it's, you know, like, Hey, you know, do you want us to live stream this for you so we can figure out how to live stream and you can get your event out there? it ends up getting us three or four leads of people who are like, Oh, I need you to do that for me. Yeah. So that's how we pivoted. <laughs> <laughs> so it, that's actually, I think a, a really good segue. So for those that um, may have not seen the, the announcement that we made yesterday, the uh, Lumix webcam uh, beta software is available for download now on both Mac and windows OS. And this really does like start to make it so much easier for someone to just be able to take a compatible camera and be able to start web conferencing or just having the ability to send a camera feed into a computer and, and use it for your production. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes to actually walk through the process with everybody. Um, I know that we have some of the videos that are up on the actual download page, which we'll put a link in the video description below uh, where you can get the webcam software. Uh, but I wanted, uh, just like I said, I wanted to take a second here and uh, actually jump over and show everybody how we connect uh, my S5 that I have sitting up here on top of my computer uh, and be able to see it in something like zoom. Uh, so we're going to go a little technical here for, for some of this style shooting. 
So you can see, I, I've uh, got yeah. non, the non gearheads. We're listening. Yes. We're here. There you go. There you go. go. So um, one of the the big things with this is that you're going to go to the uh, the actual uh, link that'll be in the video description below. Uh, maybe Jack can drop the link to the download in the chat as well. Um, I'm going to throw something on Jack see if he can if he can do that. Uh, but once you run through the installation process, which again, follow the video that we have online, it's super simple, uh, Mac and windows, it's going to be the same process across the board. Um, what it will do is it basically allows the compatible cameras to function as webcam video capture devices. So this is different than what the Lumix tether for streaming beta software was. That was really designed for those that are using something like OBS or Streamlabs or any of those other programs that you use to do window capture like we use for Lumix Live. But what this will do is actually prompt in as a webcam. So the best way to actually be able to see this is I'm using Zoom since it's one of the more popular uh, you know, web conferencing systems. It works the same for Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, uh, you name it, the application pretty much views it. So does OBS. So uh, all you're going to do is uh, open up Zoom and go into the settings once you have your camera connected. Now, use the cable that comes with the camera in most cases. So the S5s, for those of you that have been uh, able to get S5s, we know that uh, some of you are still waiting. Um, just hang in there. Uh, demand is awesome on the camera, so uh, just hang in there. Uh, with the uh, S5, it has a uh, USB Type-C to a USB Type-A cable in there. So plug that into your computer. If your computer doesn't have a Type-A, um, you can use things like this, like these high-quality uh, USB 3.0 A to C converters. Um, I've used them, and they work fine, as long as it's a high-quality one. Plug them in together. Uh, the camera is going to prompt you to say, do you want USB C or USB Tether? Uh, print, uh, pick bridge or send files, select PC tether. And what you'll get is when you go into the uh, camera here, you'll see that it'll pop up as Lumix webcam software for your streaming. So right now, as you can see on the camera, we've got, um, zoom open with the S5 that I have over here on the side with the 45 millimeter 28 signal lens on there, uh, acting as my webcam. So now you can use this in pretty much any platform. Uh, it'll be the same for whether or not you're using Windows or Mac OS. Uh, the installation files, obviously, just make sure you download the right one for your system. Uh, and really, the only thing else that you really want to look at and make sure that you're doing is having some sort of audio uh device for this because USB doesn't send audio over. And my understanding is this is pretty much the same for every USB camera type capture. Uh, if I'm wrong, please don't crucify me. Um, I haven't looked at every single camera out there, but I, uh, this will let it, uh, send the video over. If you use some sort of USB controlled microphone, uh, headphones that happen to have a microphone as well, that can work for conferencing. Uh, or even just Bluetooth earbuds, which I use often, uh, that have a Bluetooth microphone. As long as you have something like that, just tell the software that that's your audio source and you're good to go. You're able to start streaming and conferencing and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, for those asking, uh, yes, there are limited cameras that have capabilities for this. Uh, check the link in the description on the playback once this video is uploaded. It has a list of what what good um, or what cameras are compatible. It also has a list of what programs are compatible and whether or not you have to be on a specific um, browser type, since all browsers are a little different in the way they handle things. Um, just make sure to check those links and uh, you should be good. Uh, the only other thing that I want to mention about it also is that uh, since it came out, actually a couple people have uh, messaged me uh, directly about this stuff. I, uh, when you're using zoom, since again, I focused on zoom and zoom is one of the most popular ones being used for this. Make sure your zoom is updated. I think the most up-to-date version as of the release of this video is like 5.3.1. Make sure you're on the most up-to-date version and you should be fine if you're not getting a video signal. Um, and yeah, so you guys should be good. Uh, 
uh, let's see. Are there any other questions down in the chat about this? Um, before I jump back over to you, Matthew. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I just learned. I took notes. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Uh, any other questions? Um, a couple of the questions you guys are asking about pricing for weddings. Um, I, I don't know, Matthew, if, if, if you want to give some insight on that, um, yeah. cool. But I know that it varies a lot also depending on the region you're in. Yeah, so, but I answer that question a lot. So cool. that's that's a that's a really good question, actually. And I think I think the only thing to remember is that you you should add in the expenses that it takes you to to execute the wedding. And you got to think about more than just Oh, I own the camera expenses my time. I think that's where people like uh, undermine the industry a little bit sometimes is they're like, oh, I can charge 600 bucks and go film a multi-cam wedding and give them the kitchen sink. And now um, the the problem is like you got to think about the fact that it's not just your time. It's also insurance. Um, it's also your gear. Like think about renting your gear to the production and what that would cost. So I think about that as a business owner all the time. Like if I were not involved and I had to hire somebody to shoot it and I had to hire somebody to edit it and I had to hire somebody to, I had to rent the cameras and even rent my computer and my software. Like there's expenses that go into all this that we have to take into consideration when we price out how much we charge. Um, <clears throat> I would say a pretty good industry standard nationwide and i've been i've talked to lots of people nationwide who do this um you know i would say you shouldn't go below 1500 when looking to, to actually give a professional wedding video usually i'd say two to three thousand dollars is a pretty good industry standard nationwide and you're talking about a multiple camera wedding now you, it, it obviously can go way up from there based on how how experienced you are and what how good of a storyteller you are and um all of all of the things that go into you know why tiffany's is a certain kind of brand and why you could get your wedding ring at costco and some people love their costco wedding ring and there's nothing wrong with that but what kind of a brand are you are you a, a boutique brand where people like i'm only going to book me and myself um for a wedding on a specific day and that's it. I do one or am I a volume brand and do I have, you know, an approach that's more like, well, I'm going to hire other people to do a similar style that I do. So, um, I, I would say just as a general rule, if you're charging below $1,500, you're, you're probably not thinking about all the expenses it takes to actually execute a wedding if you weren't involved and you want to build yourself up to be able to, to, to get to that level. So, um, I would say, is that a good answer? Two to 3000 and then on up from there. I mean, yeah, we've, we've done five figure weddings all the time and people pay it. And I know yeah. there's some fantastic people in our industry that laugh and go, well, I wouldn't go below 10,000 if you, you know, if you asked. So, and that, and they're fantastic at what they do. So yeah, um, there you go. Yeah. Those, those I think are great points is, is, you know, find what, what kind of, of style you want to go with, what kind of, of wedding videographer or photographer you want to be and own it. I think, people in general tend to undervalue their own time as well, which, you know, like you said, you always have to make sure that your time is actually worth, you know, that, that, that you're accounting for your time. Because, yes. you know, hey, that, that one little extra edit, sure, it may only take you five, 10 minutes, but that's still five, 10 minutes of your time that you could be I out mean, doing something else. Yes, be out with your family, could be out, Yes. Uh, getting better at what you do so you can charge even more. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> let's see here. Um, let's see. What other uh, questions do we have here? Um, let's see, there's a couple technical questions that are coming in. So I want to take um, the last couple, like we have about 10 minutes left uh, for, for this week's uh, session. So uh, let's go through and and answer some of the questions that you guys have had in here that are maybe a little off topic, 
Um, but kind of relevant here. So uh, the first question I see here was actually from uh, Carl says, Hey Sean, why is it possible? Why isn't, why isn't it possible for the S series to take a picture while filming? MFT cameras can do that. Is it implementable via, via firmware update? Uh, so I, I don't know what the reasoning or what the, the cause as to why the S series isn't able to hit the shutter button and capture a still at the same time while recording video. Uh, I will, I, I will have to double check, but my understanding is that when you are doing that with the micro four thirds cameras, like a GH five, when you're doing that, you're capturing the 16 by nine, eight megapixel or two megapixel, whatever the image is that you are capturing of the video, because it's just grabbing a still out of it. Uh, in the S series and actually in any of our cameras, you do have the ability to just roll the video playback in camera and just click the menu set button on that video and you're able to save any still out of the, the camera. So you don't necessarily have to think about it while you're shooting to say, okay, I've got this recording and then I can just click the shutter button and record um, or grab that still. Uh, you have the ability to do it afterwards so that you can pull those frames out of it. Uh, and doing it that way actually, I think, produces a little bit better of a quality um, because you're already working with the the file the way you had it captured. Um, I, I, as to that, I actually give uh, wedding photographers stills off of my video all the time, and I do that exactly like you're talking. I just play through the video, freeze it, and make an image out of it, and... I'm a lifesaver for them who might have missed a moment or missed a shot. So that's how you can endear yourself to your photographers that are at the weddings. Yeah. Um, and also, I know it's a little slightly off topic, but I love the I love the opp the opportunity we have to, with the dual SD cards where you can send video to one card and photos to the other card. Will you talk on that for a second, uh, Sean? Because that's something that not a lot of people realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for those that are, are using cameras that have the dual memory cards, whether that's the S series, uh, the S5, the GH, GH5S, G9, uh, they all have dual memory cards and you have uh, a ton of different capabilities. You can allocate record, which means, as uh, Matthew was saying, your videos all go to one card, your JPEGs, all, JPEGs and RAW go all to another card. Uh, you can mix it where it's redundant or backup recording so that the cards both equally fill with all of the content that you're shooting. Uh, and you also have relay record. So you can be doing, uh, you know, situations where maybe you're, you have one camera set up and it's doing the full event, just a one long take of everything. Uh, you can set the camera up to do relay so that say you fill it with two 128 gig cards. It fills card one automatically jumps to card two and they're hot swappable, so then you can just go in, change out card one with a different one, offload it, and then when it fills card two, it goes back to card one. Um, you have tons of capabilities with those. I think it really, um, just as you said, sometimes it's 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 really overlooked, uh, you know, what you can do with the SD cards, but um, it, it can save you a lot of time in post, uh, figuring out and splitting out your photos versus your videos versus 4K photo if you've done those, uh, it, 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 at least I know, I know in my usage, it comes in handy for casual shooting. I can only imagine for so, someone like you that's using it in a professional sense. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, because I do time lapses all the time. So having it with all my video files, go to one card, my photos go to the other. I don't have to like search through the thousand time lapse <laughs> pictures that I just took in order to, just, I just want the finished video. I don't want to care about those pictures. So it's great. I love that. Yeah. So let's see. What other question we got here? Um, Cam 35. Uh, I, I, I will take a shot at this to give you an answer that I th hope makes sense. Uh, the question was, is it possible for the GH5 and the GH5S to have full V-Log? Uh, it's just a software thing, right? As, and that's the question. I'm not saying that. <laughs> uh, full V-Log. So V-Log in the GH5, the GH5S, and the G9 is designed based on the sensor characteristics. Vlog, um, Vlog in the S series, so in the S1, the S5, and the S1H, have 14 plus stops of dynamic range that they can they can express, uh, and that's Vlog and V gamut. The GH series and the G9 have because of the sensor, you're not 
getting the same dynamic range out of it. So just saying, you know, throwing a quote unquote full vlog on the camera isn't necessarily going to change anything. Um, the vlog L that's designed and profiled for that sensor is maximizing what the sensor is capable of doing. Uh, so I see it a lot online, people asking that question, you know, why can't you just implement full vlog? Uh, you are getting full vlog for that sensor, if that makes sense. Um, it's the same reason why when you look at some other log files, you have different versions of them. They're all tuned for different things um, to maximize what you have in your setup. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Hopefully that was was enough uh, for you. Uh, I apologize if it's not the answer you wanted to hear, though. <laughs> um, I mean, they're getting full vlog for that sensor. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, let's hear, here, here's one, uh, uh, for you, Matthew. Uh, this one's from Kevin. Uh, what ND filtration do you recommend for exposing? Um, do you use ND filters? Um, I tend to not use ND filters on a run and gun wedding shoot because I've got multiple different lenses and I don't want to be swapping ND filters. I do have an ND filter for, um, my main lens, my 12 to 35. And it's a, it's a, it's an adjustable ND filter. I don't have any idea what brand it is or anything like that, but it does help. Um, I know that like the, I, I, I know that it helps your footage. I know it basically means that you don't have to raise your shutter speed in order to, you know, like in the daytime, basically a light. Um, it's, they're great. It just ends up being um, a little too cumbersome for a run and gun wedding. So I tend to not focus on those very much. Uh, but I I know they're great, and I use them for corporate work all the time. So um, I I would say use your ND filters whenever you can, and it's not going to get in the way of your filmmaking. I mean that's that's the thing for me, like if something gets in the way of your filmmaking, you're not helping yourself. So uh, if you find a workflow where you can use it, I think it's fantastic. Um, I highly recommend them, but yeah, cool. don't tend to use too much. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, one of the other questions here, I, I'm trying to find who asked it. I apologize uh, if, if you asked this and I don't call your name out, I apologize. Um, someone was asking what, uh, what slider do you use? Uh, do you have a recommendation on what works for you? I've got an awesome pro media gear slider. Um, it's basically, it's a, it's a 24 inch slider. It it's perfect. I mean, basically we just want movement, right? So I don't need a huge long slider. A 24 inch slider is perfect. It's portable. Uh, pro, pro media gear is awesome that it's got a carriage and it has a motor attached. I can detach the motor so I can use it for lapses and nice motorized time lapse, which is awesome. Um, and it flips over and it has a parallax, a little rounded slider on the bottom and a straight slider on the top. So Ooh. it gives me a really cool, yeah, like I'll usually shoot the bride's shoes on that parallax slider and kind of be going around them and it looks awesome so highly recommend very cool very cool uh all right let's see the, this one's gonna relate a little bit to the question uh before about the pricing for um for weddings but uh what kind of advice do you give to someone getting into wedding videography who might be a little nervous um because of the lack of experience in shooting weddings um i would i would definitely say do like i did my first three without charging a dime. Like I, my, my wife's friend was getting married. She didn't have any way you do a video. That sounds stupid. She thought, and I'm like, Hey, can I do that? I'm going to be there anyway. Can I just have maybe film it? Um, and that gave me the opportunity to mess up, screw up. Nobody cared, right? Like they, so basically I would say, get out there and try it, do it it's, it's a lot of work. It's not, uh, you know, I, I remember one of my best friends at the time told me he had actually done it for years and quit and said it was terrible. Like, don't ever do that. Like, well, get out. What are you doing? Um, I love telling those stories. It's the greatest day of their life. It's, it's just this fantastic 
moment where they, you know, it's like the first day of the rest of their life kind of moment. So yeah. it, it gets me every time I f- cry when the father daughter dance happens and all that stuff. But I would say, do it, do it for free for a few times and don't get in the way. Um, that's my biggest advice is a lot of people, like a lot of videographers will think it's their film shoot and we try to stay out of the way, let people try to think of it in terms of like, let them have their wedding day and let's capture it the best we can from afar, yeah. <laughs> from a little bit of a distance. Uh, but yeah, and that's what I did. And you'll, you'll learn quickly if it's for you or not. And then you'll start to understand how much it costs, well, how long it takes you to accomplish everything. And then what you charge from there. Yeah. Um, and I will reference one one thing. Uh, I did. I do have another video that's uh, that's we did an office style wedding at one point. Um, I would encourage wedding filmmakers who have done this a long time to get out there and like get out of your comfort zone and break the mold. Um, we shot a wedding with like as it was an episode of The Office, and it was one of the most fun things we've ever done. It. It, you know, it was so hard and it was so scary and so invigorating and the bride and groom love it. And I'm doing another one um, next year that's going to be an office style wedding shoot. And it's just a blast. Everybody loved it. So um, you know, do something like that that breaks the mold and, you know, kind of reinvent this industry. Let's go do it together. Hey, there you go. Let's see here. Um, we're going to take one last question because I see that this one's been asked a lot throughout here. Um, and I think it really does actually need a little bit of an explanation for some users. Um, and then we're going to call it for this week. So the question comes from Lee. It says, how come 4000 ISO in hybrid log gamma on my GH5S has far more shadow noise than 5000 ISO in hybrid log gamma? 5000 ISO is much cleaner. So when you're looking at cameras that have what's called dual native ISOs, depending on the picture profile that you're in, those ISO values may vary. Uh, now, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head uh, for what the GH5S values were for uh, hybrid log gamma, V log L, and then the other profiles like Cine D, Cine V, and standard. Um, what basically what you want to look at is that if you need to say, shoot at 4,000 ISO, and that's where your exposure is telling you to be, shoot it at 5,000 ISO and either stop down or know that you can pull the exposure back, um, on the, on the, the computer by changing those color profiles and working with the actual native areas of the sensor. If you're finding that 5,000 is cleaner for you. Uh, you're able to to shift and, and work on the right circuitry for it. Uh, shooting at a higher ISO in the high native ISO range, so I'll use the S1H as the example here because I know those numbers off the top of my head. If you shoot at 4,000 ISO on the S1H because you want to shoot at high ISO uh, be, and your exposure is telling you to be at like 2,500 or 3,200 3, ISO, you have, yes, a little bit less dynamic range by stopping down or pulling your exposure, uh, but you're going to get a much cleaner looking piece of footage than if you were shooting on the low circuit and gaining up from there. It's the same thing on the GH5S. So just look at uh, what ISO range you're on. Are you on low or high? If you're in high and you know that you want to shoot at 4,000, Go to high and shoot at 4,000 instead of leaving it in auto or leaving it low. Um, you'll get a much cleaner looking image overall. Um, so hopefully that was a, a hopefully that answer worked for for what your uh, question was. Um, you had me. You had me at V gamut. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was great. That's a good answer, Sean. Cool. So um, actually, I I will take one last question here. Um, I know I, I, I always keep saying that. Well, yeah, one last question. Uh, this one from Mark Plummer. I mean, if Plummer. they've got questions, let's answer them. Go. Yeah. yeah. This one's from Mark Plummer. It says, do you use V-Log for your time lapses? Um, I'll, I'll ask you that question, and then I'll, I'll give another answer that I have as well for it. I personally do not use V-Log for time lapses. Um, I'm, I'm using natural profile uh, all the time so that I can get a nice finished video right out of camera that I 
have very little color correcting work to do. I'm trying to maximize profit and uh, minimize my time spent. So, uh, and yeah, so my time lapse is straight out of camera. Cool. Now, for for those that that do utilize vlog for your normal video shooting. Uh, this is where it actually gets a little tricky and you have to think a little different from your normal, you know, kind of video shooting mindset or, or film shooting mindset. If you're doing time lapse uh, and you're setting the camera up because it's in photo mode for that, don't shoot vlog. Um, I, I, now this is obviously my, my opinion. Uh, everyone's obviously it's your camera. You're willing, you, you know, you're capable to do with what your camera, whatever you feel like you want to do with your camera. Um, but from a technical perspective, shooting in vlog, uh, even in stills for JPEGs, won't actually give you any big advantage for the overall shooting quality that you're going to get out of that time lapse. If you shoot in raw, so raw stills in the camera, raw stills in like the GH5S and the S series is a 14-bit still image. So you're still much higher bit depth, you're much more flexibility in dynamic range because it's a still image. Uh, shooting in vlog, if you shoot in raw, when you load that into your software, it's just going to ignore vlog anyway and go to a some sort of standard color profile. Uh, that's typically how Adobe works. Uh, if you are working with um, uh, JPEGs, then you are working just with the JPEGs that come out of the camera. So it will look flat, but you have to remember that JPEGs are 8-bit. Um, so you're handicapping yourself there with the color profile. Uh, basic tip, shoot raw, shoot in standard or whatever color profile you want to shoot in. And, and know that your raw file is going to have much more flexibility for matching in post. Uh, so hopefully that answers the uh, time-lapse question there. Uh, with that we are going to actually call it for this week. Um, and uh, before we do that, I want to thank you, uh, Matthew, for taking the time to to jump on the call here or on the video stream. I keep calling them calls. Uh, <laughs> for uh, jumping on with us, uh, could you let everybody know where they can find you, where they can follow you online um, and, and see more of your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you. The easiest way to go is uh, Matrimony Films on Instagram. So Instagram, at Matrimony Films. Um, got a YouTube channel. It's Matthew Sutherland, Matrimony Films. Um, and I have uh, a corporate brand that's about to be launched called Tiva Cinematics. That's going to be vlogging. Um, I just got this cool little G100 uh, vlogging camera, which I love. And uh, I've made about seven different vlogs. So I'll be vlogging and kind of helping like show people what we do at our workshops and stuff like that with Panasonic. So that's how you can find me. Very cool. And we will put links uh, to the YouTube channel, your you know, the different social media platforms. We'll put links in the video description. Uh, and for all the videos that we showed during this, uh, during this event, uh, you'll have cards over those videos for you. And then uh, also uh, the video that we talked about with the, uh, the office style, we'll also have a uh, card uh, so that people can check that out because it, it definitely cool. is really cool. That's a fun so, one to check out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so right. with, with that, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us, for hanging out with us today. Uh, if you liked this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the Lumix Cameras channel, hit the bell icon so that you get notifications when we go live. Uh, we go live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and we will be live next week, Thursday at 2 p.m., uh, to actually shift a little bit more, uh, to actually start talking about some of the camcorders that we have and some of the cool functionality that you have in those. So if you're looking in for that kind of information, be sure to check out that stream next week. Uh, with that, thanks, everybody, and we will see you all next week. Bye.